Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. My life changed very quickly from being very happy with a great marriage to the princess of our town, two lovely kids, a successful business, and living in my favorite place. But then things got really bad in just a few weeks. I live in Culverson, a small town in the Midwest with about a thousand people. The closest big city is about 60 miles away and there are some smaller villages in between. In our town, we have a few important shops and services. We have a couple of stores like Walmart where you can buy groceries, toys, clothes, and more. There's also a small pharmacy, a true value store, and a farm store. For food, we have a couple of places to eat, but there aren't any fast food restaurants here. We also have a bank and a credit union for money stuff. Amidst these establishments, my computer services business thrives. Primarily focused on a consulting, I offer hardware solutions like computers, servers, and monitors catering to clients who seek comprehensive network packages. Among my clientele are esteemed institutions such as the bank, the local hospital, and the school system. My closest competitor operated in the neighboring urban city, yet I still managed to attract clients from there and frequently found myself troubleshooting their networks. But before delving further into my professional life, allow me to introduce myself. I'm John Edwards, 30 years of age, standing at 6 feet tall and weighing in at 180 pounds. Up until recently, I was married to a woman I'd known since middle and high school, Amanda Butler Edwards, though soon to be remarried as our divorce has been finalized. Our union lasted seven years, which I believed were fulfilling, but evidently Amanda had a different perspective, blindsiding me with the divorce petition. It's worth mentioning that Amanda and I weren't high school sweethearts. In fact, we scarcely interacted despite attending the same school. We didn't really hang out together, not even in college. Honestly, I felt some anger toward her back then. She was like the princess of our town because her dad owned the only bank there called Butler Federal Bank. Her dad gave loans to local farmers, the feed store, Mark's Superstore, and almost every other local business. In our town, people usually went to the bank in person rather than doing banking online. Even I got a loan from her dad's bank to run my small business. But let's get back to Amanda. It wasn't until after we both finished college that she started showing interest in me. I have to admit, I had some crushes on her during high school. She was the classic beautiful blonde, tall, nice body, and she was the head cheerleader. As for me, I was pretty into sports. I played football, basketball, ran track, and played baseball. Now, Amanda wasn't exactly stuck up, though she might argue against that label of confronted, but she did exude an air of entitlement. In high school, she dated the quarterback, a multi-sport athlete named Simon, who also excelled at basketball and baseball. Simon eventually earned a full-ride scholarship to a different university to play football, which marked the end of their relationship. During our college years, Amanda and I traveled in different circles. She was heavily involved in her sorority, which happened to be the largest on campus. While their corresponding fraternity held the same status, they were constantly hosting events, keeping Amanda occupied outside of classes. On the contrary, I was more of a nerd. Much of my time outside of class was spent delving into hardware, software, and various systems, grappling with the intricacies of computerization. My field of study demanded as much dedication outside the classroom as within it. Moreover, I had to hold down a job to help cover expenses that my modest scholarship didn't fully address. My dad worked at Mark's Superstore as a manager. He earned just enough money to get by, but not enough for me to get any extra help. To show you how different our lives were, my parents' house could be four times bigger and still not as big as Wayne Butler's house. During the summers, my dad and I would go camping almost every other weekend. We loved fishing together. Meanwhile, Amanda and her family went on fancy vacations to places like Aspen, the Ozarks, Miami, and sometimes Hawaii or Maine just for fun. So Amanda and I were really different even though we were from the same small town. When I came back from school, Amanda suddenly wanted to date me. It felt like she was following me around. Honestly, I didn't really get why she liked me so much. I had started my own business, but it was just me running it at first. I got some money to start it, and I made a small profit in the first year. Eventually, Amanda mustered the courage to ask me to dance one night when we both found ourselves at the same bar with a live band playing. Surprisingly, we clicked well on the dance floor. Thanks to my mother's insistence on learning various dance steps, I didn't embarrass myself too much. As the bar closed for the night, we parted ways with a kiss by her car and my promise to call the next day to arrange a proper date. I grew up as an only child, a result of my mother's medical condition that hindered the normal development of a fetus. I suppose you could say I was a bit of a miracle baby. In contrast, Amanda had a brother who left home at 18 and essentially disappeared.
perhaps due to his strained relationship with Wayne. In the year following my graduation, tragedy struck when my father succumbed to a sudden heart attack. My mother recounted how he had been discussing mowing the yard, only for her to later discover something protruding from the small shed door at the back of our property. By then, it was too late. My father had collapsed, and despite the arrival of the ambulance, their efforts to revive him proved futile. He had already passed away by the time my mother found him. Despite our budding relationship, Amanda attended my father's funeral, offering me comfort as we laid him to rest. Her presence by my side at the cemetery, her hand in mine, and was a solace amid my tears. Moreover, she displayed remarkable grace towards my mother and the handful of family members when traveled great distances to support us during our time of grief. Fortunately, my father had ensured that our family home was fully paid off before his passing, and his substantial life insurance policy provided my mother with a steady income for the remainder of her life, provided she managed it prudently. It was a blessing amidst the challenges that lay ahead, which I'll delve into shortly. Contrary to the cliché of a man chasing a woman until she catches him, Amanda and I followed a different path. She pursued me, initiating our dates and our intimate life. I won't go into all the details, but let's just say we got along really well in bed. From my point of view, our relationship became exclusive, and I didn't hear any rumors about her seeing other people. We spent intimate time together two or three times a week. Sometimes I had to travel to nearby areas for work. Some big farms wanted to connect all their computers like the ones on their tractors, milking machines, and home computers to Wi-Fi. Because of how far apart everything was, my work sometimes kept me busy until late at night. I often wondered if Amanda stayed at her parents' house waiting for me to come back. Oh, I almost forgot to mention Amanda's job. Because she studied women's studies in college, she had trouble finding a good job in Culverston, so she ended up working for her dad. She started as a teller at the bank and quickly moved up to become vice president of the loan department. While her rapid promotion might have been attributed to nepotism, she dedicated herself to the role and diligently educated herself in the intricacies of banking as her father desired. Reflecting back on those years, I can now see how I was maneuvered into marriage. One evening, just before Christmas, Amanda dropped the bombshell that she was pregnant and demanded to know my intentions. Raised with values instilled by my parents, I immediately proposed marriage. In hindsight, I should have been more skeptical when Amanda and her mother selected a wedding date seven months after the announcement of our engagement that Christmas. However, by the time I realized the deception regarding her pregnancy, the plans were set and countless invitations had been dispatched. Confronting Amanda, her response was nonchalant. She simply shrunk her shoulders and justified her actions by saying, if I left it up to you, we would never get married, let alone engaged. I love you and you love me. This will work. As for myself, I was enamored with the town princess. Our physical chemistry was undeniable, and the thought of sharing a life with Amanda was appealing. So despite uncovering her deceit, I chose to go along with the wedding plans rather than rock the boat. Our wedding became the talk of the town, a grand affair that hadn't been witnessed in Culverson's history. Every soul was invited, and we even scheduled it for a Sunday afternoon to allow businesses to close. The feast was lavish, catered by a firm from our neighboring urban community. Our honeymoon in Barbados was quite the adventure. Amanda discovered a clothing optional beach, and she relished the freedom of nudity almost every day we were there. Surprisingly, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, immersing in all the island had to offer. We explored everywhere on a motor scooter and even went snorkeling in the clear waters of the Caribbean Sea. When we got back from our amazing two weeks, it was time to get back to work. By then, I had grown my business to have three technicians and a secretary to help keep things organized. Before our marriage started having problems, we worked really well together. About a year after we got married, Amanda told me she was pregnant, and this time it was for real. Our little girl Jennifer was born, and she was perfect. She became the most important thing in my life. Then our son Oscar was born, and he was just as wonderful. Our family was complete, and I was so happy. But things changed in our seventh year together. Amanda started having to work more, with lots of meetings in the evenings and on weekends. While I could understand the occasional banking conference, the frequency of these events seemed disproportionate to the workload. Despite Amanda always being reachable on her cell phone, and no signs of missed calls or unusual breathlessness in her responses, I couldn't shake a growing sense of concern. Our intimate life suffered as well as Amanda was often absent before bedtime. With my own work keeping me occupied and the need to retire early due to early morning customer visits, our time together dwindled. Although I had more assistance with the business, it was primarily to prevent me from burning out. 
Despite our collective business, I prioritize being home in the evenings, especially considering Amanda's unpredictable schedule with the children. I recall vividly the last time I shared intimacy with my wife. It was a Friday evening, and to my surprise, she had already returned home and prepared a delightful supper for us. The children were ecstatic, chatting away with their mother throughout the meal, so much so that we had to remind them to eat. Afterward, we all pitched in to tidy up the table, loading the pots, pans, and dishes into the dishwasher, before settling down together to watch Shrek for what felt like the umpteenth time. The children were overjoyed to have Amanda back, and she had to personally tuck them into bed that night. I was strictly forbidden from entering their bedroom. Once the little ones were settled, Amanda returned to the living room, carrying a couple of glasses of wine, and adorned in high heels and a delicate garment known as a babadol, which only enhanced her beauty. We settled on the couch and sipped our wine, while Amanda whispered what she wanted me to do that night. She didn't want affection and love. No, she wanted hard, and I gladly gave her what she asked for. I exerted myself to the fullest, pouring every ounce of energy into the moment until I succumbed to a dreamless slumber. When I woke up on Saturday morning, Amanda was already dressed and holding an envelope. She said, Time to wake up, dummy, which was strange because she had been nice the night before. I felt confused and tried to understand what was happening. She said the kids were ready to go to her parents' house for the weekend, and that's where she would be too. She told me I had 48 hours to pack my things and leave the house. She said she would get a restraining order against me on Monday because she thought I was mentally cruel and might become violent if provoked. The divorce papers in this envelope will be filed at the same time. I was dumbfounded, struggling to comprehend the sudden turn of events. Summoning whatever courage I could muster, I managed to stammer. What's happening? Why are you doing this? Simple stupid, she retorted dismissively. Simon has joined the bank as dad's right-hand man, and we're getting married as soon as my divorce is finalized. We've been reconnecting for months, and now it's time to make it official. With those words, she delivered the final blow to my world. Oh, and one more thing, she said casually. Simon can't have kids, so he wants to adopt Jennifer and Oscar. Then she slammed the door and left me feeling like my whole life was falling apart. For the next 12 hours, I couldn't stop thinking about the letter she left behind. Amanda's demands were overwhelming. She didn't just want the house, she also wanted my business. But under her terms, I would barely make any money from it, even less than my employees. She wanted full custody of the kids and asked for child support that I couldn't afford. She had already spent most of our savings, leaving me with almost nothing. And even though she would earn more than me, she still wanted alimony, which seemed really unfair considering our different financial situations. While Amanda's car was in her name, mine was owned by the company I worked for, so I could use it as long as I had a job. Facing the tough reality of my situation, I decided to do something about it. I got a loan to buy a pickup truck and trailer, since our mutual friends couldn't really help me. I asked some old high school friends for support, and they came through for me. We loaded up the trailer with my stuff that Amanda probably wouldn't argue about. With nowhere else to go, I went back to my workplace. I had bought the whole building the year before to expand, and I found a small, neglected apartment on the second floor. I decided to make it my temporary home. I spent all of Sunday cleaning and organizing it. I used an air mattress for a bed and got some old furniture and kitchen stuff from my friends for comfort. I only had a modest microwave and a cooler for food until I could get a refrigerator. Monday morning was tough. Sleeping on an air mattress made me sore, and there was only cold water in the shower upstairs. I had to use a small tank in the bathroom downstairs for warm water. Despite all this, I managed to look presentable after shaving. I needed legal advice, so I tried to contact some local lawyers, but they weren't very welcoming. It seemed like my father-in-law had already spread bad things about me. I couldn't get any help, and even the loans I depended on were now at risk. I had to go to court that morning, feeling alone and vulnerable. Judge James presided over the proceedings, and an uneasy feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. His close ties to the Butler family, evident from his frequent appearances at their events, coupled with the likelihood that his financial affairs were intertwined with Butler Federal Bank, did little to assuage my apprehension. The judge's first words were directed at me, his tone stern. Mr. Edwards, why are you not represented by counsel? Your Honor, I humbly apologize. I responded, attempting to maintain composure. I was served with the papers by my wife on Saturday morning, leaving me little time to seek legal representation before today's hearing. Despite my efforts, no local attorney was willing to take my case. I respectfully request a continuance to seek counsel from outside the area. No, came the quick answer. I don't understand why you're delaying. 
The court set this date three weeks ago, and you were told about it when you were given the papers. You had time to get a lawyer and give your financial information. Trying to delay things like this is wrong. Your Honor, I object and want this on the official record, I said, my voice desperate. It feels like I'm being pushed into a settlement that only helps my wife and hurts me and our kids. Our earnings are listed together, so she knows my finances. Asking for child support doesn't make sense. And she plans to get married right after our divorce, so I shouldn't have to pay alimony. The judge banged his gavel emphatically. Silence. You, sir, are out of order. You've had ample time to respond to the summons. I rule in favor of the plaintiff, he declared firmly, slamming the gavel down once more before abruptly exiting the chamber. I was left reeling, the reality of my situation sinking in with brutal force. In a matter of minutes, I was divorced, facing the prospect of limited access to my children, and my business had been stripped away. Glancing at my ex-wife Amanda, I detected a flicker of guilt in her expression, quickly masked by a haughty stare. You better get to work, she admonished coldly. I don't pay you to sit around looking like someone just ruined your day. As hatred threatened to consume me, I forced myself to maintain composure, acutely aware of the watchful eye of the bailiff. It was clear he harbored no warmth toward me. Simon and Amanda's attorney rose from their seats, exiting the courtroom. I remained seated, biding my time. I couldn't afford to provide them with any ammunition that might land me in jail, a realization that dawned on me as a plausible goal of theirs. The bailiff approached me discreetly. They should be out of the building by now, he whispered. The other bailiffs are keeping watch. But you know the influence the butlers wield in this town, even in the county? Get yourself a lawyer from the state capitol. That should put enough distance between you. We sympathize with your situation, but can't risk being implicated. I nodded in appreciation and thanked the bailiff for his discreet counsel. Stepping out of the courtroom, I couldn't shake the feeling of being scrutinized by the uniformed personnel lined up to observe my departure. Heading straight to the office, I was surprised to find that Amanda and Simon hadn't arrived ahead of me. Their overconfidence had played in my favor for once. Without delay, I ensured that all staff members were preoccupied with their tasks. Seizing the opportunity, I hastily drafted a check for cash and dispatched our secretary slash bookkeeper to the bank with strict instructions. She was to explain that I would be out of town servicing distant clients and required cash for the trip. I chose not to visit the bank personally, anticipating potential obstruction. If a court hadn't officially said the business belonged to someone else, the bank couldn't say no to me taking out money. This kind of thing happened a lot in small towns. People like to use cash instead of cards to avoid bank fees. My name was still on the bank's papers, so I could take out the money I needed. My credit and debit cards weren't working, so I took out cash instead. Even though there was enough money in the account to pay my employees, I didn't want them to suffer. So, I only took out a little bit of money to pay them. I also took all the cash we had in the drawer and left a note for my ex-wife and her new partner. I felt like I had lost, but I also wanted revenge. Amanda, Simon, and Wayne needed to face consequences for their actions. As for Wayne's involvement, it was clear to me that he was the mastermind behind the ordeal. Had it not been for his influence, I would have been served with the divorce papers earlier, securing the opportunity to enlist the help of a local attorney and receive a fair judgment from the court. But Wayne's disdain for me, coupled with Amanda's compliance, fueled their scheme to exact revenge. In the late afternoon, Amanda and Simon finally made their appearance at the office, ready to assume control. Presenting Dorothy, our secretary, with signed court documents showcasing the transfer of ownership to a new corporation, they relegated me to the role of a mere manager rather than an owner. Fortunately, they refrained from publicly announcing my diminished status and salary. With only Dorothy privy to the details necessary for processing payroll, the rest of the staff remained oblivious to the discrepancy in our earnings. Aware that Dorothy would likely inform the rest of the staff about the changes, I resolved to maintain business as usual, at least for the time being. When Amanda and Simon made their unwelcome appearance, I quickly concocted an excuse about attending to a client's urgent needs and swiftly departed. The last thing I needed was to risk violating the protection order and inadvertently play into their hands. Thankfully, the protection order only mandated that I stay a hundred feet away from any of them. However, in our small town, such a distance might as well have banished me to a life under a bridge outside of town. After wrapping up work, I sought solace in one of the local bars owned by a client of mine. Thanks to my efforts in computerizing his point-of-sale system, he could manage his operations efficiently. As I approached the bar, the owner greeted me with regret in his eyes. I'm sorry, John, but I can't serve you, he said quietly, his voice tinged with sympathy. 
Words out, serving you, talking to you, or even being friendly could spell trouble with loan accelerations. You'll have to leave. Understanding the gravity of the situation, I nodded in acknowledgement. Aware of the blind spots in his security camera system, I discreetly made my way to the back door. Waiting for me outside was the owner, a 12-pack of my favorite beer in hand. John, I'm sorry, he murmured, offering the gesture as a peace offering. Hopefully, Butler will come to his senses and put an end to this nonsense. With that, he slipped back into the bar, leaving me alone with my thoughts and a small token of solidarity. I hugged the wall, making my way back to my desolate apartment. I found a used but functional mattress, box springs, and Hollywood frame propped against the back door. Relief washed over me. I wouldn't have to endure that aired again. After chilling the beer, I carried the bed up to my apartment and set it up. With a few beers and a comfy bed, I had a better sleep. The next day, I went to Mark's to get groceries. But when I got to the checkout, they asked me to leave without buying anything. Mark himself came and said he couldn't go against Wayne Bubbler, who had a lot of influence. John, I like you and your family, but I can't go against Wayne, he said. He pushed me out, pretending to be angry. That night, I found all the groceries I had picked out packed in a wooden box with a lock next to my back door. The key was on the front tire of my car. When I tried to move the box, I realized it was really heavy because it had steel plates on the bottom. It became evident that my mysterious benefactor had taken precautions to prevent theft. Though it wouldn't deter a determined individual, it served as a deterrent to the average passerby. Leaving the box outside, I ventured out of town for a couple of days to attend to other clients. A seed of an idea began to take root in my mind. Unable to procure what I needed locally, I stopped by a small out-of-town service station and purchased some small fuel cans along with regular gasoline and diesel fuel. On each trip out of town, I diligently acquired a couple of key items necessary for my plan's execution. Meanwhile, Amanda and Simon intensified their efforts to torment me. I was compelled to change my phone number due to Amanda's incessant calls, only to have law enforcement officers visit me repeatedly, accusing me of violating the protection order. Despite proving that I never answered her calls, I endured their harassment, being told to quit messing around and leave each time. The situation escalated to the point where I couldn't even fuel up my car. A company vehicle, no less, without encountering trouble. I had to delegate the task to someone else just to ensure I could continue with my work. My scheme finally reached fruition when Butler Federal Bank began harassing my mother. She received countless calls urging her to take out a reverse mortgage, while the county claimed they hadn't received her tax payment. Upon contacting the tax office, I learned that Wayne Maines was exerting pressure on them to harass my mother. This was the last straw. Wayne had crossed the line. Unable to threaten my mother directly with a mortgage, he resorted to other means of harassment, causing her undue stress. I had enough. With just a week to prepare, I knew my retaliation had to be swift and effective. I planned to act at night when only a few police officers were on duty and probably sleeping in their cars. Along with planning my revenge, I got an old beat-up pickup truck from a farmer in a nearby town. I didn't register it right away because the license plates were still good for a few months. The farmer hid the truck behind an old house about a mile outside of town so no one would see it until I was ready. When night came and all the town stores were closed, I started my plan. I made sure each place was empty and dark. I didn't want to hurt anyone too badly, but there were a few people I wouldn't mind seeing get hurt a bit. I started by turning off the fire alarms in the stores which I had installed before. I left the hospital and bank alone because messing with their systems could break federal laws. My first stop was the convenience store on the edge of town. With a swift blow from a brick, I shattered the glass door. Armed with a makeshift Molotov cocktail, created by combining diesel fuel and gasoline, I ignited the wick and hurled it inside, ensuring it caught a shelving unit to break the bottle upon entry. Across town, I repeated the same tactic at the other convenience store, the wails of approaching sirens marking the response of the volunteer fire department to the initial blaze. A smirk played on my lips. Wayne, who had maneuvered his way into becoming the volunteer fire chief and sat on the fire department's board of trustees, had always been obstinate about allocating funds for improvements. Tonight would serve as a reckoning for his short-sightedness. My next destination was the farm supply store, where the manager had always been a vile character, even before my own persecution began. There, I strategically deployed three Molotov cocktails at various points within the building, ensuring the fire could spread rapidly. Despite the sprinkler system activating, the lack of supplemental water from the overwhelmed fire department rendered it futile, allowing the flames to engulf the store unchecked. As the flames engulfed most of the commercial area in town, I placed a call to my former residence using a burner phone. 
Through the electronic voice changer I had acquired, I kept it brief and to the point. Disguised as Darth Vader, I warned Amanda about an arsonist and advised her to take herself and the kids to my mother's house for safety. From a discreet vantage point down the street, I observed as Amanda left about an hour later with the kids, heading towards her parents' lavish mansion. I anticipated her reaction, but she was in for a surprise. Taking my time, I ensured that my old house was ablaze before casually strolling a couple of blocks to my car. Upon Amanda's arrival at her parents' gated community, yes, our quaint town indeed boasted a gated enclave complete with security patrols. She was greeted with a sight of their home engulfed in flames, her mother standing outside in distress. It turned out that I had overseen the computer system for the gated community and their security company. Conveniently, the security patrol was occupied responding to a break-in alarm when the fire ignited. Later, I found out that Amanda and her mom stayed at my mom's house because even the local hotels had computer problems and couldn't take guests. My last move was to leave the company car at the office. Then, I threw my last Molotov cocktail into the car and set it on fire. Amanda, Simon, and her dad didn't know that I had canceled the insurance for both the building and the cars. I went to the first fire scene where the fire department was trying to stop the fire from spreading. Wayne, Amanda's dad, was there in his fancy firefighter outfit, telling the crew what to do. The police were busy investigating other fires, so no one stopped me. Wayne had upset the other fire departments, so they weren't coming to help. He was facing the consequences of his actions now. I sneaked up behind Wayne and used the voice changer again. Placing a small dowel against his back, I delivered the message as Darth Vader. Do not turn or make any sudden movements, or you may face severe consequences. Wayne froze about to protest, but I silenced him. Shut up and listen. Your town is burning down, and unless you mend your ways, further consequences will follow. No one is immune to retribution, not even your own home, which is now engulfed in flames. Heed this warning and change your behavior. Ensuring he remained immobilized, I gave him a forceful shove, causing him to land in a muddy puddle. His pristine white gear was now thoroughly soiled, much to his dismay. As he attempted to rise, I nudged him back down with my foot, leaving him with a face full of mud and water. With that, I departed, vanishing into the onlookers gathered to witness the futile firefighting efforts. Making my way to the concealed pickup, I drove out of the vicinity, keeping a safe distance. I knew that despite the corruption, an incident of this magnitude would prompt at least some investigation, and I'd fully expected to come under suspicion. I relocated to a bustling metropolitan area, three states away from my hometown. There was no attempt on my part to conceal my identity or establish a new persona. Frankly, I didn't see the point. My access to my children had been severed. They were now under Simon's care. Financially, I was destitute, unable to provide child support or alimony. With law enforcement likely on my trail, I refrained from launching a new business endeavor. Instead, I secured a position in the aid field, a familiar domain where I resumed my previous line of work. I exercised caution, even driving considerable distances from my apartment to make phone calls using a burner phone, driven by my paranoia of being tracked. As it turned out, my apprehension may have been unnecessary. When I finally reached out to my mother, she greeted me with relief, eager to share the latest developments in her hometown. Firstly, I'm relieved to hear from you. Initially, there were concerns that you might have been inside the apartment during the fire, but no evidence of your remains was found. Eventually, speculation arose that you had left town after leaving a resignation letter for Amanda and Simon, which likely perished in the fire. Thanks for getting in touch quickly to tell us you're okay. Secondly, Amanda and Simon didn't get married after all. It turns out Simon was already married in another state and hadn't finished his divorce. Amanda and the kids stayed with me until she could find a new place to live, which is actually smaller than your old house. Lastly, the fires caused a lot of problems. Many of the businesses and homes that got damaged were insured through the bank's insurance company. The big claims made the insurance company cut ties with the bank's insurance agency. When they looked into it, they found out that Wayne Butler, who was the fire chief, hadn't let the fire department use modern methods and hadn't made agreements with other fire departments for help. So, the insurance company is taking legal action against Wayne for causing all these big losses. Also, a new bank has opened in our town, and a lot of the businesses affected by the fires got loans from them instead of Butler Federal Bank. This means Butler Federal Bank lost some money. Unbeknownst to me, Butler Federal Bank had a board of directors who are displeased with Wayne's management. He's currently under close scrutiny. Furthermore, since Amanda's marriage plans with Simon fell through, she has rescinded the protection order and is eager to reconnect with you. Moreover, the children remain legally yours. 
Amanda has petitioned the judge for modifications to the divorce proceedings, as the finalization hadn't reached the 90-day mark. It's possible you're still legally married. The kids continue to inquire about you daily when they visit here after school. In a surprising turn of events, it came to light that Judge James had a collection of cars, a fact he had kept under wraps until that night. Unfortunately for him, the collection was destroyed in the fires. Rumor has it that Wayne, in an attempt to minimize expenses, only insured the cars with basic liability coverage. Because of this, the judge lost a lot of money, and he started acting differently towards Wayne Butler. Right now, we're looking for a new police chief because the sheriff decided not to run for office again. Some deputies and officers have quit because of this. Amanda's parents are having a hard time finding a place to live after their house burned down. It's tough to find a temporary place to stay, and they're not sure if they can rebuild their house because there aren't many builders available. Amanda even asked me if they could buy or rent my house, but I didn't trust them after how they treated my son. Wayne tried to be powerful, but now that he's in trouble with the law, people don't listen to him as much. Even the tax assessor didn't listen to him. Interestingly, my missing tax payment showed up after that night when some of the assessor's vehicles caught fire unexpectedly. It seems like Wayne's power is getting weaker, and a lot of people are happy about that. Most people aren't too bothered by the fires and think they might actually be a good thing. But the business owners who were affected and Wayne Butler are really upset about it. Well, it seems like I'll need to come home soon, I said with a laugh. But first, I might need to get a better car. My old one barely got me here. I'll come see you soon, Mom. Second story. Wife 42F of 17 years just told me she cheated twice, while I37M was his boot camp. Wife 41F of 17 years cheated on me 37M when I was in boot camp. TLDR. My wife 41F of 17 years just now told me she hooked up two different times while we were engaged and I was in boot camp. Need help. When we first met, we really hit it off. We quickly started making plans for our future together, and I felt a strong connection with her. I knew she had just ended a tough relationship with someone who treated her badly for four years. She had been through a lot and was still dealing with the aftermath, including an unplanned pregnancy and subsequent abortion. She opened up to me about it, and although it made me think about leaving, I cared about her deeply and wanted to support her. We became very serious and decided to move in together, sharing a rental house with my brother and his girlfriend. Eventually, we even got engaged. However, I realized that I didn't have a stable job to support us, so I made the decision to join the Marines. We planned to get married before I left for basic training, but we worried about upsetting our families, so we decided to wait until I returned from training to tie the knot. We wrote each other every day, and it really helped me get through it. The drill instructors would tell us about Jody at home with our girls, and I thought, not me, our relationship is strong enough. I was so excited to see her at graduation, and then I left again for more training. We got married right before getting assigned my duty station. We were so happy. It has felt like a fairy tale ever since. Our relationship was the rock and core of myself. I've had cancer diagnosis, other major events, and took them all in stride because I had a solid relationship. Fast forward 17 years, 18 next month. We have a great life and child together, and she admits to me that when I was in basic, she hooked up two different times. One with my brother's GF's brother in the house we had together while he was visiting. They had known each other for a while, and the other was another bartender at the bar she used to work at. I asked her why, and she said it was tough, and she was lonely, it was just sex and attention, and that she never didn't love me, I can't understand that. I just feel devastated and rocked to my core. I'm on here because I don't want family and friends to think differently of us. We have this whole amazing life together, and I don't want it ruined by this, I just can't understand. She said she has been faithful and took our wedding vows seriously. My vows didn't matter as I felt the same from the moment we were together. Any have a similar situation or advice? Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.